Welcome to The Strain Podcast, a Southgate Media Group production, where we talk all about Guillermo del Toro's new blood-sucking horror fantasy series, The Strain, that airs on Sunday nights on FX. I'm your host, Blair Knight Graves, Associate Editor from ShowRatings.tv, and with me today is Kyle Tremblay, the Editor-in-Chief at ShowRatings.tv. You can find us on Twitter at at BlairLovesTV, and remember, that's Blair with an E, and at KyleLovesTV. And you can follow this podcast's Twitter handle at at TheStrainPod. Hi, Kyle. How are you doing today? Oh, Blair. <laughs> oh, Blair. Well, we, we just watched this episode about an hour ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think the title of this episode, which actually was um, The Disappeared, should have been called Cold Shower. <laughs> because it certainly uh, was, a, was a, a splash of water in the face after uh, a, a very exciting week last week. <laughs> yes, that's true. Um, as... <laughs> As Kyle said, today we're discussing Season 1, Episode 9, The Disappeared, uh, which was written by Regina Carrado, who also wrote Season 1, Episode 4, It's Not For Everyone, which was an episode that you actually liked and rated pretty highly on our website, ShowReadings.tv. Yeah. I- I'm going to say up front that uh, since I haven't had a lot of time to reflect on this episode, I don't know whether it was bad necessarily or if I was just disappointed because last week was so good. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm going to get that out right up front that I'm I'm struggling to separate and I and you can read my review on ShowRatings.tv and I sort of get into this but I don't really come to a conclusion which is how I, how much last week's episode should have changed our expectations for what this series is because this episode was this episode could have occurred immediately after the episode two weeks ago and yes. the show wouldn't have skipped a beat you know last week was a bottle episode and it was really I would say of the same quality as the episodes that preceded it, but it just last week's was so good and so different that going back to the status quo, um, when the status quo maybe isn't that great, uh, was a real was a real letdown for me. Yeah, no, I, I can definitely uh, agree with you there, and I think we discussed that actually a little bit last week, that we, we were anticipating that it probably would uh, go back to the status quo. Uh, yes. And we're going to be disappointed, and thus we were. Yes. Um, although uh, on on Sheridan's TV with your review, you wrote uh, you wrote that you rated the episode a six point eight. Sure. Um, I probably would have rated it a little bit higher. I actually, to a great extent, enjoyed this week's episode. I didn't. I was let down because Creatures of the Night was so good, but I kind of anticipated that letdown, so it was it was made easier. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would have rated this episode an eight. Probably interesting. What did you think worked most about this episode? Because we're now we're sort of back to the business of everyone is sort of has their own little stories. You know, we we sort of break the characters off in pairs, and then they all have their own little stories. What what did you think worked in this episode? So I think what really works with the strain, and it's funny because you address this a lot in in your review. um, But I think what works is when characters actually have something to do. um, Mm -hmm. But when the show is actually trying to just kind of fill space is when it, it's bad, like when it had characters lounging around in uh, yeah. two, two scenes in this episode. Actually, I would say more than two scenes. There's probably four scenes in which <laughs> characters were lounging around. But the, the, the moments when characters had anything to do, whether it was, uh, even, even though we will address the issues with the, the fight scene with Vampire Matt, Vampire Sears manager, um, mm. and uh, that was still, I could still go with that. Um, and I enjoyed everything that had to do with Felix and Gus, as I always do. Uh, I know that you don't always. Um, nope. and <laughs> No. And I, uh, I enjoyed all of the Nazi material, per usual. As uh, usual. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> and um, and I, I actually liked any, any moment that had to do with Fett. Uh, I really so liked Fett. <laughs> your, your, your analysis is you liked everything except F and Nora. Yes, which is really disappointing. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I am sympathetic to that point of view. Because yeah. even though I disliked much more things than that, I disliked F and Nora the most. So Yeah, although uh, you actually, Kyle and I live tweet the strain on the East Coast airing every Sunday night. Uh, and I was tweeting that I actually really thought that there was a lot of character progression this, uh, this episode for F. Uh, and Nora, even to a degree, and uh, what, what did you respond? You you were very you were funny, like oh, because he's actually one character now. Uh, I think that's he actually has a character. Yeah, uh, which I think is probably why I did enjoy F 
that much in this episode. I enjoyed yeah. that, like, he felt like a real character. He felt like a real protagonist who had real feelings. Oh, protagonist? <laughs> I wouldn't say protagonist. He, to me, feels like, like, oh, I'm trying to think of, like, a Walking Dead comparison, which you wouldn't get anyway, but for the listener. But, um... Merle? Merle? I don't know. Uh, no. Not, no. Well, maybe. Uh, he, he feels like dead weight. He feels okay. like the dummy in the group. Like, like he's he's the he and Nora are like the backwards uh, two tourists who somehow got it got in as a part of this band of world saving heroes. Like <laughs> their role in this world at the present time is to be is to be willfully ignorant of the reality of the situation. Which yeah. again, as we we covered this last week, it's better that it's not just Nora. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly, because that that opened up a whole uh, a slew of problems with, with the way the show treats women. So at least now we have F being an idiot, too. And so there's, you know, it, that solves one problem, but it also creates a situation where ostensibly the two protagonists of the show are now just being the biggest dummies I can imagine. Like just, yeah. yeah, it's interesting when they don't have sciencey things to do. They are yeah. really hard. They're really hard to watch. And that's um, sorry. That's the thing. You're absolutely right that they need to be playing to their strengths. Like these two characters, their strength is not burning the body of the Sears manager and then eulogizing Jim Kent over the ashes. Their their strength should be the science. They should be the lab people. You know, like they were last week, where where mm-hmm. they had to perform the uh, the surgery on, on Jim Kent, and even though that eventually turned out to be meaningless, that was a really good scene because they got to be useful. And mm-hmm. so, Ephenora, instead of making them, I guess they're trying to, I guess the show is trying to make them the moral center of the show, which just seems way off because the show is not playing its cards close to the vest at all regarding who's right in this situation. There's right. no there's no case to be made for Ephenora. It's mm-hmm. the show is clearly and decisively saying that Abe and Vass are doing this the right way, and right. so there's no if they're trying to be the moral center of the show, it's it's not a dichotomy that's working, and so what they should be is the science aspect of the show, the lab geeks, to reference your favorite movie Pacific Rim, <sighs> um, the two the two geeks in the lab who were who were entertaining and like that that's who they should be. I mean, obviously it's not the same dynamic, but it should be the the science. You know, they bring in the science yeah. in. But, that's uh, that's yeah. sarcasm, by the way, everybody. Yes, I, I, was, I, I, I hate I hate Pacific Rim. Yes, um, and I love, I love Pacific Rim, so I tease Blair about it. Yes, uh, but um, no, relevant, I feel like, this is Guillermo del Toro. Keep going. Yes, Sorry. very relevant, given that you know I normally love Guillermo del Toro. Yes. Um, but yeah, they should be observing. They should have, even though it's so stereotypical, they should have a notebook that they're writing in. They should be trying to track the symptoms. They should be yes. acting. They should be acting like scientists. They should be acting like the characters that they were built to be, instead of trying to be the emotional core. I think again to reference your review again, but you you wrote like there's this invisible ship that everybody that you think that the creators are trying to get everybody on board for of getting Nora and F to like have their relationship and everybody to enjoy that. But that's you know which we <laughs> we saw in this week's episode in yeah. a very. Uh, Let's well, yeah. Awesome. Let's unpack that. Let's unpack that scene. Yeah. <laughs> Holy uh, cow. Wait. Do do we want to start at the beginning or yeah? Do yeah. Sure, sure. 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 Okay. All right. So, well, I guess starting off at the beginning is a little bit difficult. We obviously okay. So we just covered. You know, let's just go story like, by story. I mean, again, right, this episode right. was very paint by numbers. Where they have pairs. I mean, mm-hmm. I said this like five episodes ago on the podcast, where they the, the show loves to take two people and give them a little story as part of the big story. And this episode was yeah. exactly that. So let's just go through the through the stories. All right. Well, let's finish F and Nora since we're there. Oh, okay, uh, great! Yeah. <laughs> we need to talk about that bedroom scene. What a pardon my French, but what a shit show! Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, by uh, uh, like you referenced, like in my review, my only uh, the, the only explanation I have is that the show inexplicably thinks that the audience is shipping F and Nora, mm-hmm. which is amazing. That's that's yeah. uh, that's just that's like a wow. Like you got to sit back in your seat and really contemplate how the show came to that conclusion, <laughs> because uh, there was just nothing in that scene to indicate any any other intention like why was that scene there other other than to give caddy neighbor diane another scene for no reason no reason whatsoever like well or to 
have this root against F. Like, I, I keep talking about the confusion that the show has of, like, because yeah. you said, like, would you call him a protagonist? I'm not sure I would. Like, he's he's a very stereotypical character. I say this every week. But he's very stereotypical, like, male protagonist, male middle-aged guy who's, like, everything he does is fine, but he's also making all these mistakes that hurt everybody in his wake. Yeah. Um, like, but we accept him because that's the, you know, he's supposed to be our hero. Mm-hmm. Um but like this is like the most egregious mistake I think when yep. he's he's supposed to be going and finding his lost ex-wife who you know who he has a child with yeah. and uh and whose home you know he is invading he's just killed her lover yes uh, and goes ahead and has has sex with the woman he cheated on her with yes in in her bedroom <laughs> yes it's, and it's that. it's like it's more be, morally it was- incomprehensible like just it, like and, and they're supposed to be the moral center of yes, the show but exactly this is, so this is the worst like i i'm not one to judge people's interpersonal relationships no. that's pretty gross yeah that, that's it's it's gross and the fact that it's occurring during the apocalypse doesn't help and that those two should have anything better to, to do than, than, than sleep with each other in uh in, in in his ex-wife's bed um it was all very don draper of him Yes. Um, right up until the point that he said in front of Nora that he still loves his ex-wife, which, I mean, like, Don Draper's not going to say that. He's <laughs> even, even at his worst moments, Don's not going to be like that. So, I mean, yeah, it, it's a moment that, that it certainly was intended to make F come off terribly, I'm guessing, and make yeah. it sympathetic to Nora. But it just made me think, well, wow, Nora is an idiot and right. F is a monster. Like, yes. this is a... These, these two people. Why, why did they help? I, I tried to get into this in the review. Why do they need to burn the body? What's what's going on here? Yeah, like, no, that's yeah. You you brought up an interesting point that there's lots of bodies that we haven't burned. And there's I'm pretty a, there's sure we... dozens and uh, thousands of unburned bodies probably in the between yeah. the senior center, between the Times Square when the the coroner was massacring people, between yeah. all the other attacks that I'm sure occurred off screen because there's a whole like you know mini army of vampires in right. the sewers and they come out at night. So there are bodies everywhere. Right. There's so my thoughts on it is that anywhere that Abe can burn a body, he will burn a body. Like, obviously that is a recurring thing that his character does. Uh, and, I, and he sent F and Nora to do it in this case. Um, okay. and he's especially doing it when it's in the homes of people who could become infected. So like out on the street, you, you mentioned this in your review, you know, there's a vampire that nobody paid attention to that Gus hit. Uh, yes. and he's out on the ground, but he's, he's outside and the sun can get there and the sun can kind of burn up. The um, the worms okay. once the sun comes back out, but once you're in the home, you know anybody who enters can become infected yeah. so, because those worms are going to crawl everywhere and find find a new host. So they didn't just burn the house down like they did with the neighbor's house. No, because this is F's family home. Yeah, they're not going to burn that house down. So we're still we're still at the point where like we haven't accepted that this is like a worldwide. No, they, no, I mean they, no, they haven't accepted. I, I mean, obviously, they haven't accepted it at all because there's not chaos in the streets yet. Like, which is which is the other problem. <laughs> which is like the biggest problem. The big the problem, which the is that problem. Yes. we st- uh, we're still getting scenes, not to jump around, but we're still yes. getting scenes where there is a prison guard who is c- completely unaware of what's happening. Yes, and where the radio is the radio announcer. Uh, is is giving reports like, oh, New York City's emergency room's really full right now. It's like, wait a minute. There were people being murdered in the streets, yes. and now the radio is working, and that's what you're reporting on? Yes. But, like, so the, to go back to, to F, though, is that it is still at the point where we haven't accepted okay. that the apocalypse is happening, and it is at the point where there is still human sentiment, and there's still sentiment for your earthly belongings. Obviously, you know, yeah. Um, as we've seen, I believe in the. I never finished The Walking Dead. I'm sorry, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do that to myself. But like you could see, as by the end of season one, you could see a, a, a bit of acceptance from each character when they had to abandon all their homes that they had barricaded, and you know they're out and they're they're going right. and they they're living off the land eventually. But we we're not there yet. We are we're still pre actual yeah, event fair. like fully coming through. So yeah, there is still sentiment and. Sentiment for your wife's, you, you, for your family home where you go and you sleep with the woman you cheated on <laughs> yeah. your wife with. Your I don't sacred know. home. Yeah, your sacred I, home you go and you defile. I, I don't, like, it's I, so weird. I, I hate casting judgment on characters that way, but, like, that that's, 
it's just the boundaries. I, I guess I, I don't understand why it took so long. Like, it seems like, could you just, like, drag him out? Like, you put some gloves on? Dra- like, why? why well, no, because they-, they have to wrap him so that they don't, so that the worms don't jump out at them. Okay. Right? Because the worms are going to try to escape. Sorry, I'm thinking way more logically. No, no, that's good. That's good. That, that's I appreciate your explanations because that's the kind of stuff I need. Because it just seems like I don't understand. This seems like a very crucial point of this whole deal. Where, where they still, like you said, the, the the world is still intact. Yeah. So if if the master were stopped now, as Abe has communicated, the whole the whole thing would go away. Yes. So it seems like right now is a really, really crucial time and that they know it's a crucial time. And I just don't understand why two key members of the team are apparently taking the entire night to burn this body, to hold a wake for their friend, and to sleep with each other. Like, I just don't... I, the, this is what I... The, the second half of my review, which is what I got it. The lack of urgency mm-hmm. is just... It's... We've established now that these characters know the stakes. You know, this mm-hmm. is you can't claim ignorance with Effinor. Like they know that this is not going away on its own. They 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 know about the master, they know about all this stuff. I just don't understand how a show that's about a, a, an impending apocalypse can have so little urgency in an hour. There just yeah. there just no sense that anything is impending, like, the world is still in the same state it was back in episode two, based on the few clues that we got. You know, no, it's still no worldwide panic or anything, no radio reports about vampire monsters somehow. And, and we're just, there's no, it, it's just, it, it's like we're, we're in stasis with the story yeah, and the world. But it's ramping up more and more and more each episode. Oh, I um, disagree 100% with that oh. statement. I don't oh, well, think this episode was... I think this was one of the least urgent episodes. No, I no, no. I agree with the urgency part. But, like, the fact that... Yeah. You and I keep... I keep saying on this podcast, uh, and for our classic disclaimer, the <laughs> yes. biggest difference between Kyle and I is that I've read the books and he has not. Mm-hmm. Um, and I keep telling you, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Last week it did happen. Like, things started to happen. Uh, but I think also in this week with the Gus story, some things happened. Because Felix infected at least three people and Gus does not have the knowledge to have shot all of the people who got infected just to shoot his his cousin whom he loved and who he he had to make the hard decision to kill um it's a good transition into this character Uh, no no no, hold me out here because I need to to stop you there before we get into Gus because aren't there literally thousands of people who are infected? I, I mean, the 200 from the plane, and then we saw an entire senior center get overrun. We know that Sears was attacked, which implies that a lot of other buildings were attacked. Did they specifically target Matt Sears? I don't know, maybe. Um, the, the the guy in the streets, like, aren't there aren't aren't there a lot of like wh- why why do these three people matter more than the, the at least dozens? at least hundreds of other bodies that as presumably came back to life. They don't necessarily matter more. And that you're making an excellent point, especially about the Sears bit about that. Like nobody caring about that. Um, right. But... <laughs> they were in the hallway of Sears. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. But, but these, these three, at least who got infected, there may be, you know, other prisoners who are going to become infected as well. Um, you know, again, they're in the streets again, and I'm maybe I'm just too optimistic that like because they're out in public, they will go and terrorize the public at some point. But yeah. I'm probably just overly optimistic. But we the- already saw that with the coroner who was terrorizing the public, and nothing changed. Yeah, I'm, I'm no, the, there was no noticeable change in the world despite that happening in Times Square and in, in during the eclipse. I mean, nothing happened, and mm-hmm. so I mean, at some point, it obviously is going to matter. At some point, this thing will happen. You know, mm-hmm. it's just I don't. I there's no build up to it. Like I like I don't see any sense at all of the world making any kind of progress quote unquote progress. Like like the the only scene to point to was was a few weeks back when people were wearing particle masks on the train. And I guess the the the, the that was reinforced this week uh where with the with the radio report about people being sick. Mm-hmm. But that's that's it. I mean like there's no I it could happen next week. It could yeah. happen at the finale. It it could I mean it could happen any time there. I have no sense at all of any kind of progress being made well, in, in that regard. That's interesting. Um Referring back to something that we spoke about last week is uh, there's a there's going to be an episode. Episode eleven is called the third rail, 
um, in the in the Don't books. Spoil I, it. Okay. Careful. All right, thank you. Uh, okay. Talk around it. Uh, yeah. Okay, talk around it. Talk around it. Um, I I'm not getting a good sense of the time frame of the infection. I know we've talked about it a lot. Yeah. Uh, but like Felix, I think you said like it took him four episodes to like. <laughs> a get... shocking amount of time. <laughs> yeah. For it, the fat but, friend to die. Right, but so like it took Felix four episodes to be become a vampire but like what is the sense of time in that because what what have we seen otherwise it's like 48 hours ish maybe like i i guess i think it's about 48 hours i don't know uh, <laughs> but like so but it's but so then if, if if it took four episodes for 48 hours to happen like it felt like a lot more happened yes it, a lot more time passed Certainly. you know um it and i'm Everybody's wearing, this is funny, this is a funny observation. For the most part, everybody's just wearing black. So I don't really have a sense of going, oh yeah, they've changed clothes or anything no. like that. The <laughs> only person who like changes clothes, obviously, is Dutch Velders. Dutch Velders, work in that wardrobe. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, very, uh, it's, I, I'm, strugg- I'm struggling with the time frame of things and like the, the amount of and I, I, yeah, it's just, it's really confusing about the chaos in the streets and people aren't caring, like, they're, the flu-like symptoms, everything is just very confusing. And I think you said it pretty well in your, um, in your review, just like about the show being confused with itself or like, it's like, it's got all these plot holes that it's trying to fill. Yeah. It's just like somebody's taking a shovel to bury a dead body and they don't yes. realize that the cemetery is just filled with, <laughs> with unburied bodies. Yeah, exactly. It just uh, feels like, it, it feels like the show devotes so much time to exposition and yeah. is making these attempts, like again, I'll reference again, the radio broadcast, like it's, tr- it makes these attempts to ground what's happening in the world around our characters, but it's so nonsensical and it's so doesn't pass the smell test like it just it, it just it's just ridiculous like th- this show's attempts to to make a coherent timeline out of what's happening in the world as opposed to what's happening with our with our little group um and i'm yeah it, it's it's just the worldwide stuff is rough and that that was what disappointed me about this episode because i kind of hoping i mean what, what last week did so well is make those worldwide concerns feel less important because they really they, last week really established that our central characters are the main characters on this show and mm. the reason that the show exists. You know that 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 was something that for the first time crossed my mind last week where it's like this idea that this is the story of people as opposed to the story of the apocalypse. Right. And this week just went right back to the story of the apocalypse. You know, yeah. it's, it's just, I mean, I know characters have individual stories and all, but it's still like, we still got this bigger world that should be the interesting part, but it's so it's so incomprehensible that it just ends up being frustrating. So I, I just wish the show at this point would focus down a little more to to try to minimize those those inconsistencies as opposed to trying to justify them every now and again. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And, but, by the way, a reason for those inconsistencies, uh, the, one of the manifestations of that is Dutch Velder's continued presence, because she is a continued reminder that the all the internet is down, except sometimes, and all the phones are down, except sometimes, and the radio is <laughs> apparently still up, but no one's reporting Radio and anything. television. Radio, radio and television, television yes. are fine. Which... No, one, but no one's still no. But, no one thought to bring a camera to Times Square as the vampire was marauding. Wait. Okay, but, like, also just, okay, sorry about being in the modern era. Wasn't there this whole thing, and maybe this is just because I'm in the city of Chicago, I don't know if it happened elsewhere, but there's this whole thing about they were like, all right, we are no longer going to be using radio waves, we're going to be using digital waves. And, like, so you had to turn in all your old televisions or you had to get a special receiver. This happened, like, two years ago in real life, not not in the TV show. But, like, you had to get special receivers for your televisions because everything in the city of Chicago is digital. I don't know if it's the same place where you are uh or how it is in the rest of the country I, yeah, or the world um but like i imagine that probably new york is similar to chicago and if if everything is being transmitted digitally now and through wi-fi and things like that then if you bring down i'm really pissed off right now <laughs> oh, <laughs> if, no. you bring, if you bring if you bring down the internet you also bring down television right at least Again, sure. this is my this is my perception of the world living in Chicago when they had this big thing about you could no longer use they never no longer use radio waves. Um, yeah, well, there was so, also a point made in this episode. Dutch 
specifically had a line where she said that she brought down Twitter and Facebook. (laughs) It's like, this happened a week ago in the show's world, like more or less like five days ago or something. No, I think it's actually like three days ago. Oh, gosh. Well, either way, can you even imagine Facebook being down for three days or Twitter being down for three days? That's impossible. No, people, like, we talked about this on the podcast. Like, I would climb up yeah, onto my roof and be like trying right. to find a people signal. People like, would be freaking about that, uh, freaking out about that so much more than about the vampire apocalypse. Yes, they like, would. Like, it's such a minor thing, but like, there would be riots in the streets if Twitter was down for three days. Yeah. Like, it, 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 I there's just, a, yeah. There was practically a riot when Ellen DeGeneres brought down Twitter with, uh, with her tweet at the Oscars. Yes, right. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> like, those sites everybody, are not, yeah. Yeah, everybody freaked out for the five minutes that it was down, like, as if the world were ending. I can't even imagine three days. Right, um, so we yeah. got the, the world's greatest hacker, I guess, who, who just happened to join our team, and uh, who, who this oh. episode sure had some stuff to do. Yeah. Okay, so while we're talking about, let's cover Dutch and Fett. Um, Dutch, and, Dutch and Fett, what a pair. So, I was sitting with my roommate, and I was really upset, because I was like, okay, so I think that the reason they created Dutch was so that Fett would have a love interest. Of course. Um, but my roommate thinks that Dutch is a lesbian. Oh, I think that Dutch is a um, whatever you call the sexual orientation where the character will sleep with anyone that it makes good TV for them to sleep with. Ah, um, not a bisexual, that, but a convenience machine. I would say, <laughs> yeah, a convenience machine. A, uh, I, I guess, I guess. Uh, sort of pansexual in the way that Oberyn from Game of Thrones is. Sort of ah, just yes. sleeping with anyone. Um, mm-hmm. We could definitely have a brothel scene with Dutch at some point. Um, you know, like, like it just, I, I just think that, I mean, you introduce the hot blonde character, of course you're going to introduce that she also sleeps with women because, yeah. you know, because sweaty nerds are watching this show. <laughs> so... <laughs> oh. <laughs> So just I'm, I'm, just, I'm I was speaking from the perspective of the show, not my own opinion. Right. That, okay. that, that's yeah. why they did that because that's yeah. who they believe their audience is. Right, is guys who who would be like, oh man, Dutch Velders with another chick, <laughs> like that. Well, that's, yeah. yeah, before we knew that she was going to become a main character, we even addressed this on the podcast about how I was like, oh, of course, the greatest hacker in the world is a gorgeous blonde right. lady because could have been anyone. It could have been any like. That that could have been an average looking woman, or that could have been a, a man. That could have been a handsome. Like that could have. Been, it did not need to Sweaty be. Sweaty nerd. Yeah. It, <laughs> which yeah, which in have... reality is probably who it would have been. <laughs> <laughs> which is not to say that there are not pretty ladies out there who are hackers. But, no. Uh, but like the the reason that they did that was because they wanted some sex appeal on the show, and there's limited female characters, and there's a limited female scope. Yeah. So. Um, she is the she, she is the Megan Fox. To oh. Vasily Fett's Nicolas Cage <laughs> in, in the action movie that is the B story of the strain. <laughs> wow. Pr- I, I, I think that Fett is better than Nick Cage. Sorry, Nick Cage fans. Are, Sorry. What did but, you just say? I'm not a Nick Cage fan. We might, we might have to stop the podcast at this point. <laughs> have you watched The Rock? No. Gone we're in not 60 gonna... seconds? Are you kidding no. me? We, we, can, we can discuss this, this is, off, off this podcast. Is, uh, stop the presses. Wait, the presses are, are are already stopped because the internet's down because Dutch Velders. Uh, but yeah, so Fett and Dutch Velders, as you as you wrote in your review, they went and they lounged about in her apartment for a little while, which is a little bit weird. Just chilling. Um, they, they, yeah. By the way, lack of urgency again. They they're, they're just hanging out, sitting around. Yeah. After, he. <laughs> yeah. She, she although. I don't know how you felt about it. She screamed at some furniture, which was highly entertaining. <laughs> Maybe. But like, it showed a little bit of range. From the actress? Mm, yeah. A little, little bit? A little bit? Uh, uh, sure. But it was so, like, manufactured. Like, oh, yeah. Dutch has to go back and get her money. Oh, the money's not there. Let's have a screaming scene. Which is just one of the exam- – another example of people caring about the wrong things. Because yes. w- when the world is falling apart around you, you don't grab cash. You grab things that people might need to trade with you. I don't know. Maybe yeah. I'm thinking over analytically just... because I like the zombie survival guide. Yeah. But um... – <laughs> But uh, just why weren't – you know what? I just don't understand why there was like a full scene of them just sitting around. I just, no. I, I just, I, you know, I, why? This is episode nine, isn't it? Episode nine. nine. How, how, how are people still sitting around? That's my, yeah. that's my main concern. Like, like when I talk about urgency, that's what I'm saying. Like, why do we get constant scenes where, where our main characters who are fully aware of what's happening are just chilling? 
How is that? Yeah. How is that possible at this point in the story? I, I, I do not understand. Yeah. It was a misstep on the show's part of like it, we talked about this last that last week's episode, Creatures of the Night, was just like the climactic an entire hour of the climactic scene of a horror movie. So this, of course, had to be the hour where everybody came down from that. Um, and I think that that was just a misstep on the show that instead of keeping everything ramped up and continuing forward with that momentum, they thought that oh, we need to give our viewers a break yeah. and then. And I, <laughs> let the exposition train come in, and then after oh. the exposition train has left the building, the, the ex- maybe maybe we can get a little more action. I have bad news. The exposition train is still stuck in the station. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's down for repairs. It's going to be here for a while. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> this is um, rough. I mean, it, yeah. it's just, yeah, it, it, the, the pacing fell off in this yes. episode. Oh, no, and I, and I mean, I think it's interesting because I think even the pacing right now with you and I talking about it is, is the, the same as the episode. I feel <laughs> like I'm a and I feel like I'm, it just, it was such a, I don't want to say boring because I still enjoyed myself. Like, that's, I can't, I can't let that get lost and I try not to let it yes. get lost when I'm writing my reviews is that there's a difference between cr- looking at a show critically and all the stuff that it, that it does right and wrong and actually enjoying the show. And, mm-hmm. and I, I do think they're linked and I think that there is something to be said that The Strain does make a watchable show Mm -hmm. um, and figuring out the reasons why that is. It's just, when you have an episode like last week's, it just makes you really realize what this show is missing. You know, Mm -hmm. like, 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 boy, if if it was the show, if it was that show every week, how good would this be? You know, if if, if it was, if it could do some of those things in its, in its week to week episodes, how much more fun would this be? You know, because you've got all the you've got all the ingredients here. It's just they're not being deployed right, and yeah. so that's you know an episode like this. It just it's it's more depressing than anything because you, you're seeing all this potential and only a fraction of it actually be realized, and most of it squandered through what seemed to be really fixable mistakes. Yeah. You know, they, they, again, the, the strain just pulled off a great episode last week. Like. If if the people running the show would make the right decisions, I feel like it would be a much much better show. Like this isn't like a systemic problem. It's just a it's just like a one level of decision making is off, and that's what mm-hmm. sort of mars this show on most weeks. Well, it, yeah, but so I I agree. But then there's things where it's like within all of the things that you have to wade through of all the poor decision making there's really there's some smart lines and there's some smart yes, moments there is. and re- You're right. there's i like i continue to say that structurally the show is fantastic um everything about the show from the sound design to the the camera work to the way it's edited uh the costumes the makeup everything is like structurally very very sound and it, it's ed- it's edited well and so it's watchable we talk about all the time that it's very watchable um but like so like an example is like even within like a scene of people lounging around a lot in f's house before everything even happened there's a moment between abe and fett that i thought was wonderful where Abe explains to Fett that you can't have emotions when you're fighting, you know, you yes. can't have feelings. I like you because you don't have feelings. And then <laughs> Fett's very, you know, he's he's offended by that and says he has feelings. And Abe's like, no, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, you know, that's in a scene that was very confusing, especially with the Zach character. Um, oh, gosh, Zach. Yeah, yeah it, but in a scene that was very, very confusing, it it was a it was a, it was a, a moment that was clever dialogue and well delivered by the cast. Yes. So well, like yeah. It, it, so it can be confusing too because there, like I I thought this was a really fun episode. Like I was I, I agree with you about the pacing and everything, but like in general, like whenever there was a bunch of crap I had to wade through, there were these really wonderful, enjoyable moments. Interesting. Um, I didn't that, I didn't find this fun. I didn't. I okay. normally I find the show fun. I didn't find this as fun as I normally find episodes. I thought that this was too... I think the presence of Zach really bogs things down. Mm-hmm. I think I think his... I mean, uh, the fact that they had to do these... They had, they had, to, they had to walk a tightrope with that character that, frankly, they fell off of. Which is, mm-hmm. they had to make him be in imminent danger from Vampire Matt, who we will definitely talk about in a second here. We're not going <laughs> to get through this episode without talking about Vampire Matt. But, <laughs> but they had to make it so that he was in imminent danger. He was attacked within an inch of his life, um, saved by his father, and then 
not questioning at all of that chain of events. No, not traumatized at all by not being traumatized, attacked even, by Matt. Even though we've seen Nora become very traumatized by watching a child die, <laughs> he is a child who was on the verge of dying, uh, has a totally normal conversation with his father, who lies to him about his reason for staying by saying that he has to clean up the place or his mom will be mad. <laughs> Which is totally accepted by Zack, even though he was just attacked by a monster. <laughs> I know the, the, that that might be one of the most yeah. awful. I don't even know like how to describe it. Just most awful things I've ever seen on yeah. television. That, um, a child to the, be attacked like that and to be so calm afterwards, like nothing happened, is well, baffling. And then to cry later because his parents aren't was it, was it because <laughs> his parents weren't getting back together, not because he just saw the guy he's been living with for months get murdered in front of his eyes by his father. Uh, but because something about his parents, like, so, parents like, drama. What is, I know they're trying to establish Zack as, like, being a strong kid, but why wasn't he like, yo, I was just attacked by a vampire that looked like the Sears manager, care to explain? <laughs> <laughs> like, how did you know to kill him? Why are you talking yeah. about this as if you know it? There's a real-life vampire right here. Like, well, with the, no? With, so, so he didn't, he did not have that with his father, and I don't know, I can't tell you why. Uh, he didn't. He definitely didn't have that with his father, but he had that with Abe later in the episode. Like Abe answered all those questions for him, and like talking about characters who got paired off, Abe and Zach sort of had some pretty delightful interactions, especially with their matching fingerless gloves as they yes. drank coffee together. Um, where Abe weirdly was able to talk to the child on the level that you would talk to a child about something that's very very scary, and teaching the kid how to move through the world now by yeah. telling him you got to read this and yeah they're vampires they're not sick they're not sick people like just having real talk with him but like you would talk to a kid and i thought that was super super effective and i thought that uh, was very well done it would have well, been more effective if the kid was actually scared of the very scary stuff i agree it, it, right it would have been great if abe had comforted him uh about the vampires but he only needed comforting because, like you said, he was worried about his parents not getting back together. Yeah. Not about the vampire attack he just experienced. Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't it have been more effective if Zack had behaved, I don't know, like a kid who, uh, yeah. who was scared of the monster and of his father murdering uh, the man who he's been living with for, for months now and if he had ran yeah. off and if Abe had finally been the one to get through to him by explaining yeah. this stuff in a calm and reasoned manner? Why was Zack so cool with all of this? Like, and Zach didn't yeah, he didn't, he didn't register any of it. No, and he didn't like he he didn't have a panic attack that caused him to have to use his asthma medication. He used his <laughs> asthma medication just because he had to use his asthma medication. Yeah, like, like a freaking <laughs> hipster. He, like yeah. like a hipster. He's just using his asthma, asthma medication so he could he could flaunt the inhaler. Yeah, a freaking, but, yeah. This, so uh, part of me is wondering though, is like you know just working with child actors can just be. But that wasn't it. it. That's the point I wanted to make though. This wasn't performance. This was this was written like I because I, I went I, I I was watching for that because it, it struck me as such a as such a out of place like such a non human way that that character is being written and I and I was trying to think of the dialogue like okay if he said this in a more distressed way would it convey that and honestly like the dialogue was written so matter of factly I don't know what he, the actor was supposed to do with it. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 this is, I think the actor performed as intended by the script. Okay. Like that's, that's because that was my first thought. Like, oh, the kid is like, uh, like anyone who's watched Mad Men knows like the various Bobby Drapers ruin every scene that they're in. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and so it's like, oh, this is the Mad Men thing where the child actor is not doing it right. But like, if you read those lines, like you go through those lines, they are matter of fact lines. Like he's not, it's not that he's not portraying the panic. It's that the panic just isn't there. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it, that's that's the problem. Like, it, it was written like that. Like, someone, so whoever wrote the script thought that was a good idea. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's the problem I have. I can forgive okay. kid actors. But, it, it, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the show doesn't understand humans. No, like, I think, no, that's, that's the most profound thing you've ever said on this podcast. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, the show does not understand humans. And it's it's weird because the books definitely understand humans. That's uh, awesome. But the TV show does not understand how humans. How is the child, how is Zach portrayed in the books? Not story-wise, just him. 
He's, I mean, he's similar, like, he's sort of a child prodigy type. Sure. But he definitely has lots of freak-out moments. Okay. And he, de- like, especially um, with everything that happens with Matt, which is different in the books than it is in the TV show. Okay. I won't, I won't say how it's different, but sure. it is definitely different, and that definitely affects him. And he's also a perspective character in the books. Okay. Um, not Not a lot, just a couple of times. Right. Um, well... It, uh, okay, keep sorry. Cut you no, off. I well, no, you 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 made me very self conscious of spoilers earlier. So I'm no, well, that's to... good. I mean, we don't want to yeah. spoil our. I I I get the sense that a lot of our listeners have read the books, but yeah. for those that haven't, we don't want to spoil things. Yeah. Um, but no, that that it's so it's t- it's tricky to ask about your book experience. I know, but but that that's so fascinating to me, and I think. You know, maybe after this season, if if the season has like a defined endpoint and you can sort of tell what what in the books is contained in the season, I would love to hear how it was different. Because because okay. it's just it's so nonsensical in the TV show, the timeline and everything, and everything yeah. you've said about the books makes me think that it is sensical there. Maybe I'll just read them myself. I don't know. But, oh, you could. Um, I actually uh, side note, I'm thinking about uh, doing them on audiobook just ooh. so I. Can- so I can become reacquainted with the material, and because I, I have a lot of time on the train in the mornings. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did that with Game of Thrones, by the way, yes. which is yes. why I make so many Game of Thrones references, is that I listened to the audiobooks like a couple months ago, but um, <laughs> uh, because I love the TV show so much. Yes. But, okay, so we've gone, this, this has all gone on too long without talking okay. about the main event, which is Matt, yeah. the series manager. <laughs> the main event. <laughs> the main event of this episode and possibly this season. Oh, because boy. we need to talk about his arc as a character. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this, this is a All dude right. who we had to put up with for, for like, I don't know, like, he made appearances of, what, like, five of the eight episodes that aired mm-hmm. prior to this one, and who was just wall-to-wall awful, portrayed as a complete a complete dummy. He's, he's, sort of the, he's sort of the representation of Kelly's bad decision-making after she, she left F. Like mm-hmm. he he's he's sort of used as this like way of saying like oh Kelly's kind of desperate now like she's like this is like a rebound guy that like, yeah. she's trying to make it work but he's clearly just not on an intellectual level engaged. Well, he's um, simple as opposed to yes. to F who is overly yes. complicated. She so needed to simplify her life, and that's the easiest way to do that. Yeah. So we deal with Matt for all these episodes. We we suffer through these scenes of him and F, <laughs> of him and Kelly, of him just being dumb and the worst, of him calling the FBI. Like he's basically a villain. He's 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 a domestic villain. Yeah. Uh, this show. <laughs> an emotional terrorist. A an bit. emotional terrorist. <laughs> yes. True. Appropriately strong language for Matt. <laughs> and all for the grand payoff of him showing up and getting killed in two seconds. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, well, that's, that, that was my biggest issue structurally, yeah. uh, I think, with, with this show, is that sometimes they're like, oh, it's the same thing with, with Joan Luss, I feel like. I feel like that, yes. like, yeah, we did get time with her as a vampire, but it was so anticlimactic compared to how much time we spent with her as she was going through her infection. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, she got killed by the cool vampire hunter yeah. guys. At least um, that led somewhere. Yeah, and at least that led somewhere. But still, like, you know, with her attacking her husband. Like, we meet her husband, who, you know, for many sci-fi people, is a face that is very recognizable. Uh, and then he just gets murdered within a couple of seconds of, of his own stupidity. Um, yes. and, then, and then Matt shows up. You know, we saw him two episodes ago. We don't know that he got attacked. We no. Don't see, we don't see his transformation. We don't see how long it takes. That, like, thinking, okay, I'm sorry. Wow, think about the timeline really quickly right now. Yeah. Like, if two weeks ago's episode was supposed to happen, like... The within, previous night? Well, well, was it? I thought it was. Because Creatures of the Night, what happened in Occ- Occultation was the episode before Creatures of the Night. Oh. So, like, I thought Occultation was the, um, it was the eclipse during the middle of the day, and then the night of the eclipse is when Creatures of the Night occurs, which means that this episode... No, 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 no. Uh, Occultation starts after the eclipse. That's the thing, that that, that whole no. scene was... yeah, yeah. It starts the no. night of the eclipse after the eclipse because the previous episode was the eclipse episode. Okay, okay. So then, what was, what was the Occultation, name of the- so, so the thing. Oh my gosh, we are getting way too deep in the timeline here. I'm getting lost. But okay, okay so, so, so we're using the eclipse as an anchor point. The eclipse yeah. occurred in the episode before Occultation. 
Okay. I don't have this episode list. I, I, don't, I don't either. We're going off memory here. We're going <laughs> off-roading. Okay. Occultation was started with the Joan Lust scene, where her, her husband returns. Okay. Okay. That was the night of the eclipse. The majority of the episode occurs the following day and stretches into the night. I imagine that night is Creatures of the Night, right? Okay, so then, 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 Matt's, then, then Matt's gestation period makes sense. 48 hours-ish? <laughs> yeah, it's like... 30 hours, hours, probably. 30, like yeah, 20, a little, 24. a little more than 24. Right. Um, yeah. So. Oh, sorry. But you're talking about gestation periods. And yeah. so that, that brings me to my question of the mechanics of this, which is actually a real question. A sincere question, not one of my many ironic questions. Um, is, is this, an, is this virus uh, airborne? Is the only way to transfer the vampire thing through the stinger? Or, or, or a worm? It's a worm. Or, is, is that it, though? Is, is the worm uh, it? Uh, do you want book knowledge, or do you want... I want to get to my question, my ultimate question, Kay. which is why are people sick? Were they, were they infected with the worms? With so many worms that it... it why, why are the New York City emergency rooms filled with people with flu-like symptoms? If it was the worms, where are the worms coming from? And mm-hmm. if it wasn't, is this disease airborne? Or is that a mystery? Is that intended to be a mystery? I th- okay, well, my understanding, as the show has represented it, is that you get it through the worms. Yes. My- uh, and, that the, and that the vampires are in the sewers, which means that the worms can travel through the sewers. Okay. They don't need to be in a body. That's why... Yes. That's why you need to... That's why you need to burn the body to kill all the worms before they get out, right? Okay. So that they don't need a bo- they need a body eventually, like they will. I, I don't. We don't know. We haven't seen on the show, but like they do eventually need to get to a body. They don't just survive on their own. That's not how the infection works. Um, but if they are in the sewers, then it could be waterborne, or okay, okay, okay. right? Yeah. So, so think of it that way. Okay, that makes a little sense. I I, I kind of get that. Um, do the vampires secrete the worms, or how are the worms working? Like how how okay? So there's 200 vampires in the sewers. How mm-hmm. where do the worms come in? So, like we've seen that you could behead somebody, and then the worms will start to come out of them. Yes. So, it's so they can. Them. It's inside of them. But, so it can come out when there is a reason for them to come out. Okay. Cool. I don't know if that means it comes out when they. Um, what is it that happens to the body? Is that they have one their their ability to use the bathroom becomes one? Oh yes, right. I'm trying to come up with the right words. For that. <laughs> Careful wording. I think I think you nailed it. No, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I just I'm just curious of the like how this is all working. But that makes sense. Yeah. I, I wasn't I wasn't holding that against the episode. I was just right. curious. But so uh, like what I'm holding against the episode though is just like I like we were talking about like last week's episode was so climactic. I want to see Matt get infected and freak out and be like, eaten. yes. And then, and then I want to see Matt come and attack Zach and like whatever Zach's reaction is will be whatever it is. But like, I want there to be a payoff for Matt's what? death. Um, in the same way that like, we at least got that with Joan Luss's husband, Mr. Luss. Like, we didn't we at know least, prior to that, but yes. We didn't know prior to that, but we at least saw what happened to him yes. and it was terrifying. Um, and you know, we've seen, we saw Bolivar, who we have not seen for five episodes no. now. Um, we saw Bolivar infect others, too. And, like, so it's just, like, the, there we're not, as we get farther along on the exposition train, we are deciding to leave behind some passengers. <laughs> but who we devoted time and effort to. Yes. Like, that's the thing, is, like, I don't. Why did oh, I just don't understand? Like, so the entirety of the Matt character existed so that F could kill him in front of Zach. That's it. That was all it was for. There was no. I mean, let me let me fan fiction out a real quick scene here, which is Matt gets attacked but gets away, but he is nicked by the stinger. So mm-hmm. we we know he's in trouble. He doesn't know he's in trouble. He returns home. To uh to his girlfriend to Kelly, and 
Kelly, through that, slowly realizes that F is telling the truth about all of this because right, we yeah right like is, right? is like I just thought of that now. Is it that hard for that to like to to turn that into a meaningful character? Like so, like why why was he treated like again? Why is this character who was introduced in one of the very first scenes of the series when he was outside of F's car when F pulls up to the uh, the counseling appointment or whatever that was? Um, why is that character just being killed so easily with no meaning behind it? Like why why is it so easy to kill off that character without any imprint like any I, any lasting impact? I'm thinking that we are going to get probably a flashback next week oh. where what you just said happened. We haven't had um, a single flashback that isn't to the Nazi camp. That's true. Um, but I think that this week they decided that they didn't need to deal with Matt and Kelly. But I will be sorely disappointed if they don't bring it up next week. And in the, the ad for next week, they said something to that effect of like, you know, that she must she was home and she got scared because they track her cell phone or something. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, I mean, so I, if, if it's a flashback, I'm going to be furious because it, th the whole point of this show occurring as the apocalypse is occurring is that we don't need to rely on flashbacks to tell the story of the apocalypse. Yes. Like, we're relying on flashbacks, quite rightly, to tell backstory on characters that have existed for a very long time. Yes. And wouldn't make any sense to include in the real time story of this world. You can't have a flashback to something that occurred in real time the previous week. <laughs> <laughs> that, I agree. That is but, part of the show's world, so I don't think it'll well, be a flashback. It might. I suspect it will be exposition. Yes, as the well, show loves to do. Yes, <laughs> exposition train. Yes. Um, okay, so we should really quickly before we go, we should talk about Eichhorst. Eichhorst, because uh, uh, I'm like all of the Nazi material in this week's episode in the disappeared was top notch material. I thought it was good. I, thought. I was good. very just in love with it and like and it's between that and the Gus and Felix uh scene that really made me love this episode and I, it's so funny because I think you feel the opposite about Gus and Felix yes. um but uh between the Nazi material and and Felix vampire Felix attacking a bunch of people it just made me so happy uh he's my favorite character in this episode was vampire Felix um because he had no lines <laughs> Aww. Or like two lines but he had like two lines but like just the way he attacked, it was fun. Um, it, was, it was a good shock scare. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I thought it was yeah, just technically well done. Um, but so we met the face of the master. We uh, did. What did you think? I know you've you've probably thought about him a lot from the books and such. I have thought about him a lot, and he, I mean, so I know Guillermo del Toro's style really well because, like, you know, Pan's Labyrinth is mm -hmm. my favorite movie of all time. At Pacific and, Rim, yes. No, so. Um, and, like, the Hellboy movies are some of my favorite sure. movies of all time, too. Again, and, like, it's just, he's, Hellboy's my favorite superhero. Um, so, the, 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 the master looked a little campier than I thought he would. Um, mm -hmm. Given how terrifying um, the monsters in Pan's Labyrinth and particular Hellboy 2 in particular are, um, like, they, it was still scary, but, like, there was an element of something funny about how he looked to me. And it, yeah. it, it, it just, it, that, that was a little bit, um, it, was, it was a little bit of, of a letdown, given the how terrifying everything was, even in Hellboy 2, things were really scary looking. Um, didn't and then he, didn't he look just like the ninja vampire from a couple episodes ago? Like, more yeah. or less? Yeah, he right? looked a lot like, yeah, because, I mean, they're... They're the same. Yeah, right? it, like, it makes it makes sense. It's just the I same was. Species. It kind of deadens the impact of that reveal when we already had that reveal two episodes ago. Yeah, that's true. I, that's although maybe was the reveal intended to be that? Oh, hey, he, he, they're revealing that he looks exactly like the ninja vampire. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, what I was hoping for, and what it sounds like you were hoping for, was like a visceral shock. Like, yeah. whoa, the master. <laughs> You yeah. know, because he's this character that that kills people and wears a, wears a hood all the time. So, yeah. it I didn't have that. You know exactly. Like yeah. think about in Pan's Labyrinth, the um, the creature that holds its hands up and its eyeballs are mm -hmm. in its hands. Right. Think about that. That's the type of thing that I wanted from yes. the master. Obviously, not that, but not but, humanoid looking. You know, yeah. like like real, like a like a. Because I mean, again, like until he took his hood off, he was this like mystical reaper figure. Exactly. You know, I mean, he could have looked like anything. And so. now he's sort of like a 
creature from Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> oh, wow. Shots fired at the master by <laughs> Blair. Yeah, I was a you little... You call him a beauty... That, well, now that's what I'm going to call him the rest of this podcast. <laughs> Not just this episode, but future beast. episodes. I'm gonna, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to refer to him as the Beauty and the Beast master. But that's what I, but that's what I mean about how campy he looked. Right? No, yeah, absolutely. So like I Beauty agree. and the Beast is from the '80s. It was starring Ron Perlman, who's my bae, and he's he's also in a bunch of Guillermo del Toro stuff. But like, you know, as scary as the Beast sometimes was in that show, yes, I've watched it. Um, <laughs> tough admission. Was... Tough admission. <laughs> really move tough on, admission. quick. Moving on, move on, move on. Get out of there. Um, but like, it's a very campy-looking creature. It's not scary in any way, shape, or form. Yes. And I like the, the Master. Still has room to be very scary. I think sure. that uh, is it. Doug Jones who plays him. Um, I'll go with you that. know, sure. Uh, is still doing like a good performance with with like a, the physicality of the performance. Uh, but I just like maybe it was also because he had a prior relationship with Eichhorst, so he wasn't being terrifying. He was being paternal. I thought. Yeah, he was he, totally. He was, being very paternal with Eichhorst, maybe he's going to be a lot more scary when we have to face him in other in in other situations. Um, yeah, well, I mean, he's he's very scary when his hood's on. Yes, he is. Right? Yeah. That's like that. Remember the the pilot when he kills the uh, the one air air traffic controller guy? Yeah, like, and his tongue whips out, and it's terrifying. Yeah, yeah very. Yeah, that, that's that's the master I like. I like him with his hood more than without his hood. Yeah. Um, but he, there's still room. There's room for it to grow. That was just the first time that they did it. it you know. Sure. Yeah. Some... I, I wasn't. It didn't like affect my opinion of the episode. But it, it's kind yeah. of also almost registered as like a non-moment to me. Yeah. Me it, too. Yeah. Right. Like that wasn't what I came away from this episode. Despite it occurring right at the end, I didn't come away from this episode thinking like, "Oh man, this is when we saw the master." Like I was much more concerned with the other aspects of the episode. So I was too. Yeah, yeah so no, that's, I agree that's with that. interesting. You would think was, that they could pull yeah. it off. But. I was, I, I'll come away remembering this is the moment when Abe's hands were broken. Um, yes, that was much more visually uh, imprinting than yes. than the Masters reveal. Yes, uh, and so, real powerful. that's yeah, that that's the, that's the scene of the episode that made me really enjoy this episode was, yeah. um, you know, I curse. You know, there's it's it's just one of those interesting things where the, the Nazi material is so good just because like it it plants a seed and then it delivers, you know, and then yeah. and, and it, cu- it circles back and finishes what it started, which I don't think that the modern day timeline stuff does at all. No. But the Nazi, the Nazi stuff very deliberately went, Eichhorst is fond of, of Abe. And, um, you know, when he finds him in the barracks, when he's going to find the knife, he's being very, very kind to him. Um, then we see Abe get his hands, you know, the one thing that he's, yes, he, the one thing that he's worth, that it's keeps him hand. alive, basically. It keeps him alive, gets his hands crushed, and then circle back to Icarus seeing that that wonderful delivery from the actor where he makes the decision to go, oh, this this man, even though I'm fond of this... Um, no, lo- no longer useful. He's no longer useful, so he needs to die. Yeah. And, like, that that's such a plant a seed and then grow the plant mm-hmm. by the end. Like... Yep. Beautiful, fully orchestrated. We've got a full story from beginning to end, yes. and the modern day material never did that except in last week's episode. And yes. I'm mad now. <laughs> oh no! Well, you got worked up. I know. I got yes. worked up. So, this, yeah. This, that's how this. That's the effect that this podcast tends to have. If one of us is disappointed about the episode, the other one, by the end of it, is disappointed about the episode. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, well, he, here's what I think is the key to the to the flashback material and why it's good, is that. You'll notice that we don't know what's happening in the rest of Europe, that Mm -hmm. Hitler himself is not a character on this show, Mm -hmm. and that's what we talk about when we're saying limiting the scope, which Mm -hmm. is that the the scope of the Nazi material, even though it's set in the very recognizable past um, that we've all read about in history books, is those two characters, and and the master, I guess. So it's Abe, Eichhorst, and the master. Mm -hmm. Those are the three, it's a three-character play. And there are other minor characters that pop in and out, but none of them matter. Mm-hmm. And 
it, it, it just again it's more reinforcement that when the strain focuses down and pairs away all the worldwide stuff as much as it possibly can when it grounds the show in a sliver of the world in a sliver of this much larger world but we're just we're focusing down on like one set whether it's a whether it's a convenience store or a Nazi camp is mm-hmm. we focus down on one set with with a handful of characters and tell a story the strain does that very well Yes, okay. we have, we have we have ample evidence that the strain when it, when it strips away all of the all of its obligation to tell these big worldwide stories because that's where most of the problems are happening. That's where Dutch Velders comes into play. That's where all these timeline errors are happening. They're all happening in the worldwide scale. But when 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 the show wants to buckle down and just tell a small story on a smaller scale, it does very very well at it. And that's what I what I sincerely hope the show realizes about itself. It's probably too late to happen in season one. I hope between seasons one and two, the show comes to that realization and is able to write to its own strengths. Because, again, the best material on the show is the small-scale material. And that, that's, that's where the show needs to start tailoring its stuff. Yeah. And, but I think we've talked about this a lot, but like the world is falling apart now. Yes. It is actually at the point where it's going to start to fall apart. So we're going to have a lot more opportunity to stop caring about the rest of the world and yes. just care about our, that well, our main characters. You know, you know what I want? I just want no more prison guards that are like acting like nothing is happening. <laughs> I, I don't yeah. need to see... What, what really takes me out of this world is when I see a character who is living their normal life. I just... I can't even fathom how that is possible at this point. Yeah. It, it makes no it's, sense to me. I, can, like, I cannot imagine it. Yeah, like the clerk... the. The convenience store clerk from yeah, last week. Yes. He was the biggest, he was the he was, really, the only problem of last week's episode. He was, was still living his normal life as his store was being attacked by vampires. Yeah, it was the craziest, it was awful. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And I, I, I have hope though, um, I, I have faith in Chuck Hogan now, <laughs> uh, so. who is writing a couple more episodes this season. So hopefully, you know, as we enter the the end game of season one um we're gonna get a little bit more of that small scope i hope so Uh, i hope we get at least one more at least semi bottle episode yeah i would really like that it might be asking for too much but we'll see i think we are gonna get it but i won't say anything more okay uh (laughs) teaser Yes, a little bit of a teaser. All right, uh, I want to give a quick shout out to uh all of you wonderful listeners we found we crunched the numbers there were five thousand of you in august what yeah, there are 5,000 listeners. Thank Look you, guys. It's, I know. It just goes to show you, if you start a podcast and proceed to complain about the show you're podcasting about incessantly, people will listen to it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so, yes, thank you to all of our listeners. Um, and another, the classic shout-out to the Masters Minions. It's one of the, mm-hmm. the big fan groups of The Strain, which now has a Facebook group as well as a Twitter handle. You should check them out. They're very cool people. Um, and if you guys have any fan mail for us, Ooh. you should definitely, uh, write us at the strain podcast at gmail.com. Um, because we would be happy to discuss how you're feeling. Uh, we had, we had a fan letter this week, didn't we? We had a couple. We had a couple. Oh, go. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Oh, well, I, well, we had, we had Mark responding to us, uh, who we gave a shout out to on last week's podcast. Okay. Um, uh, but we also had one from, uh, from, from Jordan. Oh, right. Jordan, who has written to us a couple of times. Yes. Who, uh, who made the comment that we actually just made about the convenience store clerk. So that was yes. good. That actually worked out nicely. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, and yeah, as I said, we encourage you always to write to us. Uh, we oh. also encourage you to write your own review on Show Ratings TV. Please. Show uh, Ratings TV. Yes. Go there. We, read my review and write your own. Yeah, we'd be happy to discuss the show with you there. Yes. Um, any other shout-outs that you would like to be giving right now, Kyle? We got a tweet tonight from uh, one of our favorite people on Twitter, uh, Joan Molinsky, who <laughs> tweeted uh, who tweeted to us saying, Discuss the first scene in detail. Matt and his stinger fail made me smile. And so uh, I just want I, I to I, – I'm, I'm happy – that I am not the only person who sees the true star of this show is Matt, the Sears manager. And, and, uh, and, and Trip Taylor. Yeah, Trip <laughs> Still holding out hope. Trip Taylor, come back. <laughs> um, 
and and, and uh, yes, it it was and uh, uh, what a, what a coup de grace to to Matt's character after a string of failures. All that character has done is fail in all of his his screen time so far. <laughs> that in his very final scene, he would fail to hit a confused child at point blank range with his stinger. There is there is no more fitting end to Matt than to die while failing to kill a child who was standing still. <laughs> that's, that's that's the most Matt ending possible. <laughs> so. That's fantastic. That's a great note to end on. Thank you, Perfect. Kyle. <laughs> um, all right. This wraps up our 10th episode of The Strain Podcast. Before we go, I want to mention a few things. You can download and subscribe to our podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. You can also hear all of our podcasts at our website, southgatemediagroup.com. Please subscribe to the show and also rate us. Follow the show on Twitter at, at the Strain Pod and Kyle and I at, at Kyle Loves TV and at Blair Loves TV. And remember, that's Blair with an E. Check out our website, showreadings.tv, to rate and review The Strain every week, as well as all of your other favorite shows. Thank you again for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. If you would like to donate to help pay for this and other Southgate Media Group podcasts, simply go to our website, southgatemediagroup.com, and click on the Donate button. It can be as little as a dollar or, well, as much as you want. (laughs) Help keep this fun going by supporting this and our other shows. Thanks again for listening, everyone. You're the best fans in the world.